Hello everyone, this is Matt Seifer with the Real Estate Finance Initiative here at Georgetown McDonough to talk about partitioning the internal rate of return as part of our ongoing real estate returns series. So if you'll recall from our prior discussion about the internal rate of return, the internal rate of return is also known as the total return, which is comprised of an income component and an appreciation component, and it is defined as the annual rate of earnings on an investment. And unlike the income return or the cash return, it assesses investment performance over a multi-year hold. So to revisit our example, you'll recall we are contemplating the purchase of a retail property in Boston, Virginia called Hoya Point. It's a stabilized property that is leased to a single tenant who is defined as a creditworthy tenant on a triple net basis for a long term. We have determined that the internal rate of return for our investment is 7.12%. The next step in our analysis is to partition the internal rate of return. And the partitioning of the internal rate of return is to ask the question, what drives the, in this case, 7.12%? And it's really a, que a question of risk. And th so the partitioning is tied to identifying the component parts. In this case, there are three component parts that really drive the internal rate of return. The first of which is your year one cash return. The second is your change in cash flow over the holding period. And the third is the delta between the purchase price and the sales price. And there is a fourth interaction effect, which is not a material effect, at least in this example. So again, to calculate our 10-year uh, unlevered internal rate of return, you'll see that we have acquired it for a purchase price of $12.25 million. You'll see the annual cash flows through years one to nine. And in year 10, you'll see the sum of the year 10 cash flow plus the residual value, which is found by taking the year 11 NOI and dividing it by our exit cap rate of 5.5%. We then have determined that the year one cash return is 4.95%. So our, uh, our partitioning of the internal rate of return first begins with the year one cash uh, return, which in this case is 4.95%. So now we, we need to determine the impact of the cash flow growth on the internal rate of return. So we have two little cash flow summaries to help us with that. So the top part says, let's acquire the asset for 12 and a quarter million. Let's hold the year one cash flow static throughout the course of the entire 10 year analysis. And let's also hold the residual value equal to what we paid for the investment. So in effect, what is the IRR assuming no cash flow growth and uh, assuming no change in the residual value? So in other words, what is our base IRR, which in this case is 4.95%. So now if we want to determine the impact of the cash flow growth on the internal rate of return, we'll again acquire the asset for 12 and a quarter million we'll hold the residual value static at 12 and a quarter million as well. So we're not getting any influence from a change in the residual value, but we will now allow our individual cash flows to fluctuate each year as per the underwriting. So you will see that this results in an internal rate of return of five and a quarter percent. So again, what this says is that the change in cash flow as we've underwritten it, uh, as, as we've underwritten it over the 10 year hold it, it is a res actually results in a 30 basis point increase in the internal rate of return. So if you think about the 7.12% total IRR is equal to the year one cash return plus the change in cash flow. So now we've determined again that basically 5.25% of the 7.12% comes from cash flow or a cash flow component. We now need to determine the impact of the change in the residual value. So you'll see again, the top part of our financial analysis is the 12 and a quarter million holding the year one cash flow static, holding the residual value static, resulting in a 4.95% IRR. The bottom component of our cash flow now says, Let's acquire it for 12 and a quarter million, hold our cash flow steady, but let's fluctuate the residual value based upon what we have underwritten the residual value to likely be in our pro forma, which in this case is a little under $15.5 million. So we're in effect isolating the impact of the change in the residual value on the IRR. 
So if you now subtract the 6.86% IRR in this analysis from the 4.95% uh, original analysis, baseline analysis, you'll see that 191 basis points are attributable to the change in the residual value. So in effect, we are selling the asset for more than what we acquired it for, and that is contributing another 191 basis points to our IRR. So to recap, our internal rate of return of 7.12% is inclusive of the year one cash flow, or, or excuse me, the year one cash return at 4.95%, the change in the cash flow over the 10 year period, which is 30 basis points, and the change in the residual value, which is 191 basis points. And the last piece of this is, is the interaction effect, which is simply the combined effect of the cash flow growth and the yield change effect based on the initial yield and cash flow level. So the interaction effect is determined by subtracting the sum of the year one cash return, the change in the cash flow, and the change in the residual value from your 7.12% IRR, which results in a negative four basis point interaction effect. So you can see now that we have the sum component parts of our IRR. So we have partitioned the IRR. And this is important because you're now able to quickly ascertain areas of risk. So you can notice in this case the importance and the impact of the cash flow. When you are considering an, an investment where the, 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 the majority, if you will, of the internal rate of return is a result of the cash flow or the changes in cash flow, that suggests a lower risk profile because at least with the year one cash return, that is based on contractual leases. So you have revenue that's coming from leases that should be somewhat dependable, presuming that the tenants pay as agreed. However, there are deals where the residual piece is larger. So for instance, a development deal, you might see a circumstance where the, ca the year one cash return could be very low for this. You know, in this instance, we might be able to swap the 4.95% year one cash return with the 1.91%, um, the residual impact. So what that would simply say is the vast majority of your return under that scenario would be due to your resale or the residual uh, sale of the investment, which would connote a higher degree of risk because now you are dependent upon the ability to sell the asset for a particular price uh, to, to, to achieve your internal rate of return as opposed to relying on contractually obligated leases. So that concludes our session on the partitioning of the internal rate of return and would encourage you to reach out to me should you have any further questions. Thanks.